today we will speak about Dukkha Nirota Ariya Satcha, the noble truth of the cessation of Dukkha. We ought to make a correct understanding of each of these words until each word is clear and precise. And then this, the whole matter that we're discussing will be understood quite clearly and simply. And we should never forget to, for a proper perspective, to remember the, the framework of the Ariya Satcha. What is it? From what? For what? And by what means? And so now we've come to the third of the Ariya Satcha, which is for what purpose? What is the purpose of the Noble Truths? So if when we come to the word Nirota, obviously there has to be something about this which is of value and benefit for human beings. And so we need to, to examine this, this matter in the meaning of word nirota until we understand its, its value thoroughly. However, when we, ble- when we translate nirota as extinction or cessation, which are the most common translations, then it, it may sound like something that doesn't have much value. And so we're not very convinced that these are appropriate translations. We would like to consider this matter quite carefully. Literally in the Pali language, nirota means to to go out without any remainder, to go out so that there's no remainder left, there's nothing to go out with nothing left over. In this is quite different with a kind of temporary going out where something ceases to exist temporarily. In Pali there's a completely different word for that. Atankama. Atankama is a temporary ceasing or temporary not existing. When something doesn't exist for a while, it's called atankama, that not existing is atankama, but then a while later it comes back, it exists again. That temporary kind of going out is not what is meant by nirota. With nirota there's nothing remaining whatsoever, and so there's nothing to come back. An easy example of the of a tankama is it's used for the sun. For human beings, the sun arises in the morning and then it goes out, it sets in the evening, and to the human being it's gone. But then in the morning it comes back again. That that kind of setting of the sun, a temporary going out, is called a tankama which is different than nirota, which is complete and final. So atankama means that right now it's not existing. Not ex- atankama means not existing at the present moment. But then it can very easily come back later. This meaning this temporary kind of non-existence or cessation is not what is meant by nirota. Nirota is where is the whatever it is has gone out completely. Whatever we're talking about, it's gone out completely so that nothing is left over. Or but be careful what it means, nothing of that thing is left over. However, there are other things that remain. That thing itself now has 
gone out completely and none of it remains but certain results will remain certain fruits of its having gone out will remain so when we talk of dukkha nirota we we feel that the word quenching is probably much more appropriate much more fitting the meaning of nirota that dukkha quenches and then none of the dukkha is is left but there is certain certain benefits or certain results which remain but the dukkha has been totally quenched we'd like you to to consider this to those of you who are native speakers of english can help us to see if this might not be a more correct translation for nirota <clears throat> another point about nirota which will be somewhat difficult for you all to understand is that nirota is a datu datu can be translated element but it has a suggestion of the word potential that which can be that which can function everything in the universe is nothing but but elements everything is made up of elements and everything is nothing but elements and we can all the kinds of elements fit into three basic kinds there's rupa datu means elements that have form which are material elements and then arupa datu immaterial elements non non physical elements and then nirota datu the element of quenching the quenching element all the other datus all the rupa and arupa the material and immaterial datus are quenched when they come into contact with nirota datu all those other elements go out they're quenched by nirota datu this is important thing to try to understand about nirota that it is one of the elements and it is the element which is the quenching or the the quenching place for all all other datus for all other elements whether physical or <laughs> immaterial although it may be a bit strange and new for you it is quite valuable to to put some pay attention to the word datu because everything is a datu another another possible translation by the way of datu is is being in itself the the essential being of 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 something within itself not not within other things so everything is nothing but datus even nibbana there's such we can there's a thing called nibbana datu nibbana datu which is the element of cooling or the cooling element often nibbana is used as a synonym for nirota and vice versa but we can make a slight distinction nibbana is the cool the cooling that is a result of nirota when something is quenched when there is the quenching element then there will be the the result of that will be a cooling of nibbana in the language of dhamma datu the elements are a very important way of of looking at of understanding things and so it would do us well to begin to understand what is meant what may be hard for us to understand is that 
This by datu, we mean something that exists naturally. It's it's just there in nature. And when any other element comes into contact with it, that thing, whatever has come into contact, quenches and then cools. So by datu, we mean just something existing in nature through itself, by na- in nature of itself. And in the case of ni- nirota datu, nibbana datu, anything that comes into contact with it then quenches, and after, by quenching, then it, it is also cooled. This word datu, of course, isn't ex- the same as the English word element is used in terms of the physical elements, the chemical elements. It's not quite the same meaning, but we haven't found a better translation yet than the word element. For example, the fire element is something which exists in nature, the element of fire. And it has a quality of burning. And so whenever anything comes into contact with the fire element, then it starts to burn. It's the same with nirota datu. This this quenching element exists naturally. When anything touches, comes into relationship or touches the nirota datu, then that thing is quenched and and cooled. Speaking in this way may be somewhat new for us, but it's the spiritual way of studying. To to study things in terms of datu is a spiritual way of studying nature and life. So when both the when both dukkha itself, the dukkha element, and the samudaya element, the cause of dukkha, whether dukkha itself or the cause, when these come in contact with the nirota element, they are quenched. They're both quenched. So dukkha comes into contact with nirota datu, and then dukkha quenches. Dukkha goes out. And then if any of the causes or origins of dukkha come into contact with this element, then they are quenched. So if ignorance comes into contact with this element, ignorance is quenched. Or when attachment, upadana, comes into contact with it, it is quenched. When craving comes into contact with the nirota datu, craving is quenched. And the sankhara, all that that proliferating and concocting comes into contact with this element, it is quenched. So dukkha itself, all the causes and origins of dukkha, when they come into contact with nirota datu, they are quenched. And none of these things remain. And there's nothing left over of these things. But there is a certain result left which is the nibbana datu, the coolness, the coolness that remains after all these things have been quenched. And there is another thing associated with nirota datu. When there is this quenching, when these, when dukkha and the causes of dukkha have been quenched, along with that there is the, the quality or the, the activity of liberating, of emancipating. And this emancipation and liberation is called vimuti, vimuti. And so included within nirota datu is also the, the, the implication or the, the activity of liberation, emancipation. And so when we speak of dukkha nirota arya sacha, we're talking about 
quenching, cooling, and liberating all together. Quenching, cooling, and liberating are all included within dukkha nirota. Sometimes the word quenching is appropriate, sometimes the word cooling is appropriate, and sometimes the word liberating is appropriate depending on what we're experiencing at this moment. We use whichever one is most fitting for the situation, whatever suits our experience. Nowadays, Buddhist studies almost exclusively translate dukkha nirota as the extinction, as extinction. They translate nirota as extinction and some as cessation. And what seems to be understood here is that then nothing is left. Everything is extinguished. And so we suggest that the word quenching is more appropriate because although none of the dukkha remains, there is the result of, of coolness which does remain. And so we feel that quenching much, much more appropriately captures the meaning here. Please consider this and see if, if this is the proper word for nirota. Whether you are aware of it or not, whether you've observed it or not, there are times when our mind, our heart, is with the nirota datu. There are sometimes when, when the mind is most at ease, most at peace, when it's most cool and free, then the mind is with nirota datu. We may not, we may not have observed this, we may never have been aware of it, <clears throat> but there are moments when the mind isn't all busy and crazy, when it's with this quenching element. Please, please learn to observe this. Start to observe this and then we have the chance to learn what nirota element is about. There are those times when the mind is above and beyond positive and negative. And when positive and negative are quenched, then the mind is with the nirota element. In relation to this word, we should use the word experience. Nirotadantu is to be, to be experienced. And so whenever there is no craving, whenever the mind is free of craving, when craving has been put out, then there is, there is nirota. Nirota is the nirota of dukkha means most specifically the, <clears throat> the quenching of craving. When the mind is quenched, that means there's, it has no desires, none of this craving. And so it's totally at ease and peace. It's not in any conflict or contradiction with reality. This is what we mean by ni dukkha nirota, the quenching of, of craving. Even if it just happens accidentally, even if it's merely a coincidence that, that dukkha is quenched, we still can call that nirota datu or nirota. If dukkha quenches or if the, the craving, the attachment, the defilements, the concocting, which is the cause of dukkha. Even if these things go out coincidentally and we're not really, we're not even aware of it, that is still nirota. However, if we're not aware of it, we don't have the opportunity to learn anything of value. And so we overlook the importance of this. But this is our opportunity to, to learn about what nirota is. To wherever dukkha quenches, whenever 
There is the quenching of defilements, of craving, of attachment, of, of the concocting and proliferating. Right there is the opportunity to experience and learn about nirota, dukkha nirota. Why is it that we like so much to go to the beach and stay at the beach or or go into the mountains. If we look very deeply into the nature of what's happening, we'll see that in certain in these kinds of places, it is generally much easier for the mind to experience Nirota Datu. Now we may not have realized this consciously, but these certain places provide surroundings that may give much more opportunity for Nirota Dhatu to appear to the mind. Now, if we're, if we're careless or foolish, we don't use these opportunities and we just get lost in various kinds of pleasures and stimulations. But if we look on a deep level, we can see that some of these settings or environments provide a much easier opportunity for the mind to, to experience nirota. It's quite unfortunate that nowadays all these places are not, they're not set up anymore to help one to experience nirota datu. They're all set up in the opposite way for other kinds of things in a way that kind of prevents or obstructs the opportunity to, to experience this quenching. This is a quite unfortunate situation the way most of the, these places now are, are operated. If we examine carefully, we'll see even that the instincts that our own instincts have a tendency towards nirota datu. Even our instincts, in their own way, realize the value and importance of this quenching element. And so, all the time, they're looking for the rest, the peace, that comes with quenching. You can even see it in puppies, how they the need, the instinctual need for rest, for peace. This is something that deserves our attention. So it is that we must study and become familiar with, get to know and understand Nirota Datu. We must provide opportunities for our minds to to get to know and to understand, to experience fully Nirota Datu. So this is enough of an introduction to Nirota. And now we'll speak about the, four, the third noble truth directly. We'll speak directly about the Nirota itself. When the Buddha after the awakening spoke for the first time about the noble truths when he came to nirota he said panhaya asesa viraka niroto the remainderless quenching of of raka raka is lust but it's here used as a synonym for craving so the quenching of craving so that nothing remains. And then jaka, which is to give, give things up, is to give up. And then bhati nitsaka, which has the meaning of giving away, but giving it back to its original owner, giving back to the original owner, meaning nature. And then muti, which has the meaning of of release 
or freedom, which has basically the same meaning as vimuti, liberation, emancipation. <laughs> and then the last is analaya. Alaya, it means without. Alaya. Alaya is to is to think back on or to reminisce about, to long for. So this means now that the the crave the craving and des- desire has been quenched. There's no more longing for the the object. Often so not only is all the the craving quenched, but any longing for whatever it is, it's been completely given up, returned to its owner, and there's no longing for it anymore. This is the meaning of analaya. An easy example is when a husband and wife divorce. They no longer live together, but it's it's very difficult for the longing to to finish. This longing, of course, is not for the future. It's a longing for the past. That alaya is that sense of of that something we once had is now gone and and feeling the lack of it and longing for it. In Nirota, this this alaya is also quenched. And so asesa raka nirota means the quenching of of basically attachment with without any scraps, any pieces or bits left over. Raka, remember, is this dying of the mind, which has essentially the same meaning of dan- dana craving and upadana, attachment. So here, the complete quenching of attachment so that none of it remains. None of the attachment remains. And the next, jaka, bhadhinitsaka, muti, have very close meanings. It means that we must rely upon mindfulness to be right on time at the moment of contact with something. As soon as any sense object makes contact with the mind, mindfulness but must be right there in order to, and then we use that mindfulness to, to let go, to, to, to give up and let go of whatever, whatever it is. So for jaka, giving up, patinitsaka, returning to the rightful owner, giving back to the rightful owner, and muti, becoming free. All of these, sati, mindfulness, is, is crucial. Then we come to the one that's, that's a little more difficult, analaya. For analaya, samadhi and wisdom, panya, must be must be sufficiently strong. Samadhi is the mind's, must be pure enough, stable enough, and active enough to be able to not, not long back for whatever it was. So this takes some is- sufficient samadhi as well as sufficient wisdom. So when we act in this way, then there's nothing left of craving. Craving is quenched. And then there is coolness. And this, to live in this way, of course, one needn't die. This is a kind of active living. This is an activity of living, this quenching that we're talking about. There's no need to die, and it has nothing to to do with death. There's life, and in life all craving, all attachment, all dukkha has been quenched. 
and there remains a, a life of coolness. So earlier we discussed how dukkha arises from attachment to the five khandas. And we've explained how by quenching that attachment, then dukkha is quenched. So the most perfect or complete meaning of the word nirota, quenching, is quenching the attachment in the quenching the attachment regarding the five khandas. This quenching must start with the quenching of ignorance and then craving quenches and then upadana attachment quenches. This is this is quenching this is how quenching must be for it to be complete. And as we mentioned, there is the very important synonym of nirota. The synonym, of course, is nibbana, which means cooling or coolness. Nibbana can be understood on many levels. There's ordinary meanings of the word as well as the highest meaning of the word. When there is the perfect quenching of dukkha so that no dukkha remains, we call that nibbana. The perfect quenching is called nibbana. But the ordinary kind of quenching or the ordinary, I'm sorry, the, the perfect coolness is Nibbana. But the ordinary coolness that an ordinary person can experience, this we use a somewhat different word, though it has the same derivation, the word Nibuti. Nibuti is something that any anybody can experience in, in ordinary life. Nibuti means basically a cool life. This so there's the highest meaning, which we can call Nibbana. And then there's a more ordinary, common meaning, which is Nibuti. In Thai, we have a, a word for this, which is just a cool heart and mind. A cool heart and mind. This is what is meant by Nibuti. It's when the mind is at ease, it's relaxed, it's peaceful in a way that has nothing to do with the defilements. When the mind feels good in a way that's unconnected to defilement, this is what we mean by nibuti. You can even just call it having a good time. If it's having a good time but there, without any defilements present, that's what we mean by nibuti. Everybody likes, or everybody loves this nibuti. Whenever the mind has some, it, it really enjoys it. But nobody knows the name of it, so we thought we'd, we'd let you know. Everybody really goes for this nibuti, even though the name of it isn't known. It's, we're not sure exactly how to translate it into English, but it basically has the same meaning as Nibbana, only that Nibbana is complete and perfect. It's, it's final, whereas Nibuti is temporary. It's, it's not yet perfect, but it has the same basic meaning of, of coolness. We can call it cool life or cool living. If it's if it's not yet complete and perfect, we call this cool living nibuti. But if if the cool li living is complete and perfect, then we call it nibbana. This is the meaning of of nirota. When all when all craving and attachment has been quenched, then there is cool living either in the 
the incomplete or the complete form. Now let's be helpful for us to know some more about perfect Nibbana, perfect coolness. When, when the defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion have been cooled completely, when none of the defilements remain in even the least way, but still the mind discriminates between positive and negative. This is the first aspect or first stage of, of Nibbana. Then when the defilements have been cooled completely, there's no greed, hatred, or delusion remaining in, in the least way, and the mind has no, no feeling or sense of positive and negative. That is the, the second aspect or stage of Nibbana. The first one, where there's no defilement, the mind is completely cooled, but there's still this positive and negative. This is called Sa Upadi Sesa Nibbana. Nibbana with a little, a little bit left, little fuel remaining, meaning the positive and negative. But then when there's no defilement and no positive, no negative, this is called Anupadi Sesa Nibbana. Nibbana without any of that fuel, any of that positive and negative remaining. To make it a little more concise, the first kind is when the mind still experiences positive and negative, but that positive and negative cannot concoct the self, cannot concoct self or ego. In the second kind, the mind doesn't experience positive or neg and negative at all. And so, of course, no, no self could get concocted. So this is why we call it new life. The, the life that is beyond the world, that is above the world, or lo guttara. Let's talk about nirota some more. There's different kinds of nirota. There's the kind of nirota where where craving is quenched, we could say, accidentally or coincidentally. There are times when, when because of the objects or the surroundings we're in, the situation around us, it makes it impossible for craving to arise. Sometimes our situation makes it impossible so that craving doesn't happen to us. And so that's one kind of nirota, coincidental nirota. It's coincidental depending on circumstances. It has nothing to do with our own effort or wisdom. Then there's the second kind, which comes from our own practice, where we, we control the mind, we supervise the mind so that craving doesn't arise. This quenching of craving through our own effort in practice is a second kind of nirota. And then there's a third kind where, where all craving has been quenched completely. So there's not any possibility that any craving would arise again. All craving, attachment, and ignorance have been quenched. And this is perfect quenching. This, we no longer have to actively practice as before. Now it's, it's automatic quenching. This, this third kind of quenching, this perfect quenching, is the quenching of the arahant, the, the awakened being, the perfected human being. Anapanasati, 
mindfulness with breathing will enable us to discover and experience all three types of quenching through when if we live with anapanasati if if we exist with anapanasati then it's quite easy for the spontaneous coincidental quenching to take place it will happen quite quite often and then through anapanasati we are more and more able to quench things through our own practice we have the uh, the knowledge the understanding and the ability in in stronger ways and then anapanasati gives us the possibility <coughs> to to get rid of the defilements so, so that there is the the complete and perfect quenching so all three kinds of quenching can be experienced through anapanasati to completely explain how anapanasati leads to these three kinds of quenching would would take quite a bit of time to explain the methods and all that of anapanasati would take more time than we have so we'll we'll leave that for another time but now we'd like to talk about some of the 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 tricks we use in 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 dealing with with this situation first of all in dealing with we don't attack the situation head on we don't struggle head on but we come at things from the back we kind of sneak up on the problem from behind we don't we don't just plow right in straight at the problem we we sneak up on it from behind what this means is we don't we don't get in there and struggle with dukkha straight on but we we sneak around behind and remove the cause of dukkha to get in there and fight it out with dukkha is a real hassle and it's it's not very successful our the trick we use is to get there behind it and remove the cause this is much more exquisite and it works much better to we've got a a nice phrase in thai that we'd like you to learn because it explains this point quite well it's a proverb <coughs> Ao mai san ran ki ki ao which in a crude way it has a rather crude meaning and so I'll translate it with some rather crude English words which means to hit shit with a short stick to hit shit with a short stick ki is is feces or or anything that's really dirty and stinking up the place if we take and if it's to clean it up we've got to get rid of it if we do that with a short stick this means like they used to use sticks to scrape scrape the toilets or to to clean up the manure around the place if you use a short one it makes a real mess and you you end up covering yourself with all this feces as you try to clean it up it makes a real mess and stinks up the place it's much better to use a long stick and then you yourself don't get dirty so attacking dukkha straight on is to ao mai san ran ki to take a short stick to beat shit but we suggest the skillful means of using a long stick it's much easier it's much cleaner and we don't suffer so much and then even better than that if you want to really be good at this is don't let it shit at all so this means is <clears throat> you don't have to 
You don't have to put up with dukkha. We don't have to fight with dukkha. Just quench it at its cause, quench it at the source and origin. There's no need to go through a lot of dukkha to, to suffer through it and go through all the hassles, but learn how to quench dukkha at its source. This is the trick we use. So now we'd like to mention cer certain synonyms of dukkha nirota because this make, these will help us to understand dukkha nirota quite easily. The first is to, to calm all concoctions, to calm all concoctions. In Pali, sapa sankara samato. All the, all, all the meanings, all aspects of con, the concocting, when this is to quench, to calm this, is one, me, one aspect of, or one synonym of dukkha nirota. The second is to throw away all the burdens. Just take all the burdens and chuck them out, chuck them away. This means all the, the burdens here means the, the five khandas that are attached to. This means attaching, clinging to the, the five khandas as I in mind. To take all this heaviness, the heaviness and burden of all that attachment and just throw it away. This is a second synonym. In Pali it's sapupadi pati nitsako. The third one is danha kayo. Kayo means to end. So it's the ending of craving. To make craving end. To end craving. Then virak, virako. This means the fading away of all that, all that, whatever dies the mind. This attachment and everything that dies the mind, that dissolves and fades away until none of it is left. There's nothing dying the mind anymore. When the raka has faded away, this is virako. And then next the word nipanang, nipanang. The last synonym of, of dukkha nirota, the quenching of dukkha is nipanang, to make it cool, to make everything cool. So both physically, mentally, and spiritually, there's no aches, no pains, no problems, no hassles, no dukkha. Make everything cool. This is Nibbanang, the last synonym of Nirota. <clears throat> so these, once we understand the meanings of these words, there the meaning is quite quite beautiful. It's a quite beautiful sounding thing. And so sometimes we just repeat these these words to ourselves. Saba sankara samato. Sabupati pati nitsako, danha kayo, virako, niroto, nibanang. These words have an excellent meaning. And it's possible to take this as a meditation, to take this as the object of the, the calm, clear mind. When the mind is calm and clear, it can put its attention and work on these things internally. Bring this into the mind and, and work on it within the mind. When the, we do this, it's called Dhamma Samati, to, to concentrate on Dhamma. But concentrate here not in a tense way, but with a, a still, calm, clear mind. In the Pali, the Pali text, the Buddha calls it Dhamma Samadhi, but now nobody talks about it anymore. But it's possible to take take these synonyms or take take Nirota itself as an object of meditation. 
However, in practice, the fourth stage or the fourth part of anapanasati is this kind of dhamma samati. It doesn't go by this name, but in practice, it has the same effect, the same result to take quenching as the object of meditation. So this this is is basically included within anapanasati. You can go to Burma, Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, or or wherever, and wherever you go, you will never hear about this. Nobody will be talking about dhamma samati. It may sound strange, but one can take nibbana <clears throat> as the object of meditation. To take nibbana itself as the thing to to work on within the mind. This is and in anapanasati, this is actually done. Although it goes by a, it just goes by the name anapanasati, but it has this dhamma samadhi included where we actually the mind actually takes nibbana as its object of study in contemplation so to to concentrate the mind upon to to gather the mind upon fully and focus it completely upon coolness upon the the quenching this this is what we mean by dhamma samati we can do it anywhere we don't have to go anywhere to do this kind of of dhamma concentration concentration upon on dhamma or if we we speak in a quite ordinary way for ordinary people we can just say aim for peace aim for peace or set your sights on calmness set your sights on calm whatever we do aim for calm find what is calm and peaceful in any kind of thing we do this is something that anybody can practice in any situation we can we can aim for the peace and the calm that can be found within that that activity that situation that thought whatever nowadays people around the world love to talk about peace and talk about making a peaceful world and these kind of things but it never happens there's a lot of talk about it in meetings but it it's never actually happening anywhere because people don't know anything about dukkha nirota people don't understand and they aren't even interested in quenching the certain things that need to be quenched quenching ignorance quenching craving quenching attachment regarding the five khandas people don't understand anything about the quenching of dukkha so then all the talk about peace and a peaceful world and peacefulness doesn't really lead anywhere because people don't don't know how to to do the quenching that is necessary for peace one last thing we'd like to to mention is what in pali is called upaya upaya which is often translated skillful means in thai we can translate it as klet which means to make it easier make it faster make it most efficient and successful and we can actually use the english word trick for this so we'd like to talk about another trick or upaya and this this we can in and in another metaphor for this is to i'm having trouble translating this one but to take salt put salt into the salt something like this salt into the salt jim is like if you take 
your donut and you dip it into coffee mm -hmm. or something a french fry and you put it dip it into sauce so to take dip the salt into the salt take salt and dip it into the salt this is the trick we use to to deal with this our situation of dukkha this means to to take dukkha and dip it into dukkha use dukkha to solve dukkha or we can say use use dhanha to solve dhanha mm -hmm. use craving to get rid of craving use use craving to remove craving this is a trick we can use or another another idiom for this is to use thorns to pick out the thorn if you step on a thorn and it gets stuck in your foot and then breaks off it's very hard to get out we can take two more thorns and then stick them in along the first one and pull out the first thorn so use a thorn to pick out to <laughs> dig out <laughs> the thorn this is what we mean by dip the salt into the salt or use dukkha to get free of dukkha use dhanha to get rid of use craving to get rid of craving this is a trick that we can use quite successfully what we must observe is that it's a different kind of salt that we use it's we don't use the same salt there's this salt and we bring in another kind of salt to to dip in or we don't to get that thorn out we have to take another thorn to dig it out so when we talk about using dukkha to get free of dukkha using craving to get free of the get rid of the craving it's a different kind of craving it's not to use the same old craving but to use a, a new a different kind of craving to get rid of the old stuff no so notice although the name is the same the meaning is different salt and salt thorn and thorn craving craving the names are the same but the meaning is different it's a different kind of salt a different kind of thorn a different kind of craving so then when it comes to using craving to get rid of craving we don't use that this this new craving is means something else we can use the word dhanha but we mean something different with it. we just mean a certain new kind of want or a different kind of want the old kind of want that blind craving that comes from ignorance is is nothing but trouble so we we're going to use a a different kind of want or desire or what we can call aspiration aspiration the desire to be better the desire to do better to be better to use this to solve the problem of dhanha so it's we use the same name but there's an important difference in the meaning we can't use that same old problem to solve the problem but there's something similar which we can even give the same name that can help us to solve the problem within dukkha there is the quenching of dukkha the arising in existence of dukkha always contains within it the quenching of dukkha they're not in separate places dukkha and the quenching of dukkha are always together this means that if we look carefully into the dukkha we'll find we'll discover 
the means to quench the dukkha. This means dukkha will teach us how to quench it. If we understand dukkha thoroughly, within that will be the knowledge of how to quench it. So within dukkha is the quenching of dukkha. If we study carefully, if we are honest and open and sensitive, then dukkha will teach us how to quench dukkha. So this is the meaning of using a thorn to dig out the thorn. Let study things properly, study dukkha properly, and it will teach, teach us the way to be completely free of all dukkha. Study the problem and it will provide the answer. It's the same as with a fire. Wherever there is a fire, within it is the quenching, the going out of the fire. How are you going to find, where will you find the, the quenching of the fire if not in the fire itself? If the fire is here and we go looking for the quenching of the fire over there, we'll never find it. The only way to see the quenching of the fire is right there in the fire. We can't look for it anywhere else. And say the same with dukkha. The quenching of the dukkha is in the dukkha. To look for the quenching of dukkha somewhere else is an endless, foolish, impossible journey. The, the end of dukkha, the quenching of dukkha, is always right in the middle of the dukkha. So we actually ought to be quite thankful we ought to have a great bit of gratitude towards dukkha that it teaches us. Dukkha keeps teaching us and making us smarter and wiser. If we're, so we ought to be thankful that dukkha teaches us in this way. The only way, the only place to see the end of dukkha is in dukkha itself. There's, we have a pond at Suanmok which is meant to symbolize what we're talking about now. It's called the Sa Nalige. The, the, it represents, it's a single coconut tree in the middle of the sea of, of burning wax. And this symbolizes Nibbana, is in the middle of Dukkha. The only place to find Nibbana is in Dukkha. This is an important trick to Dhamma practice. For us to sublimate craving. There's all this craving in our lives. And if we can learn to sublimate it, to redirect it into aspiration, and then use that aspiration to get free of Dan Ha to eliminate Dan Ha. Dan Ha itself will just fight back and forth. So to try and fight Dan Ha with Dan Ha would just be a lot of conflict. But to sublimate the Dan Ha and use aspiration, this is a trick that will free us of, of Dukkha. So we, we put out the fire in the fire. We find Nibbana in dukkha we use we use we we use craving to eliminate craving and so finally we say thank you dukkha thank you dukkha thank you dukkha that you have made us smarter and wiser thank you dukkha that you have created the buddha Thank you, Dukkha, because if it wasn't for Dukkha, the Buddha, the one who completely understood and awakened to the end of Dukkha, would have never arisen in the world. So, thank you, Dukkha. This may sound a little bit optimistic, but it's a healthy way to look at things. So when Dukkha arises, welcome it properly, and we'll be able to 
to quench dukkha. And so the matter of dukkha nirota ariya satcha, the noble truth of the quenching of dukkha, is now is now finished, and we end today's talk at this time. <laughs>